So they asked me to speak about posterior deformity correction and really it's such a, it's such a kind of a huge topic and what I try to do is just focus on some important salient points that uh, may help you guys to evaluate and treat this condition. And these are uh, my different disclosures. And what's happening is, is that we, you know, we realize now that um, that sagittal uh, balance and balance in general, you know, how you your spine is aligned is really important. And it's funny, you know, over the course of my career, um, you know, we're doing this for about 25 years. Is is when I first started out, um, there was a huge, huge debate in spine surgery whether you needed to do a fusion after an anterior cervical discectomy, and there were many, many famous and passionate advocates that you could take out one, two, or three discs and that people would do just, just fine. Um, during this sort of the neurosurgery portion of my training, I don't think except for somebody who had a fracture uh, in a clinic, we ever took an x-ray of somebody. And people would do operation after operation and and John Jane who I trained with was a believer that if you someone had back pain or leg pain after a surgery that you just hadn't taken enough bone away then if you kept on whittling it away and whittling it away you would eventually get to a point he used to call the facet joint a vestigial joint it's like the appendix of the body that you could take them all out and it made absolutely no difference um, and usually believed that someone that came back with a complaint after they removed all of their vestigial facet joints had complaints of back pain that they had some kind of psychological dysfunction. <laughs> I see, uh, I see Charlie in the back there laughing, but he knows that 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 that, that it's true. So, uh, so basically, uh, so basically, there's been kind of a revelation that's occurred, and, and it's funny because um, you know, similarly, I, I'm 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 just kind of. Uh, giving a hard time about my, uh, about my uh, neurosurgery portion of my training, but during my orthopedic portion of my training, what we did, if we had somebody with a spinal anesthesis, um, we, put in, we put in pedicle screws and we distracted across the pedicle screws to reduce the spinal anesthesis. And I remember when we used Steffi instrumentation, we'd use a laminar spreader to absolutely distract as much as you possibly could. And by that distraction, frequently you could reduce you know, grade one or grade two spinal anesthesis. And again, we sort of wondered why uh, the patients didn't do well after those surgeries. So we've gone, we've, you know, so we have over time realized that some of the stuff that we thought was, was really the kind of the Bible of what the right thing to do was completely wrong. It's amazing looking back, and I have another talk on that about all of the really uh, impoverished concepts in spine surgery that were really, really uh, popular. So clearly, the, the, the brightest people aren't necessarily the spine surgeons because there's been a lot of years of real, a lot of really stupid things being done. But this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a patient who was sent to me, and this was done relatively recently. This is this was done at a you know kind of a big time academic center, and the patient had some thoracic area pain and had the upper thoracic area done, and uh, and after they st and then had more lower back pain. They kind of did a lower uh, lower uh, surgery, and after this, this person was uh, was really really miserable. And you know, looking at this now, we kind of recognize there was something wrong. But this patient was sent away saying, "Hey, this is fused, and there's nothing that can be done." And by doing a realignment, it, 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 the patient was was improved. So what happens is that we do realize now there's certain alignment goals. You guys have probably seen these slides. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty common. They're from Frank Schwab and Levit Virginia Lafage. And they show that you, know, you want to have the, the gravity line go through the L5-S1 uh, disk spaces. We're seeing now, and a lot of people are using things like EOS to go and see. We're, we're realizing that the center of the gra head, gravity of the head through the center of the hip joints is really uh, important. And we realize that these kind of things uh, are, impor are important. We also realize that uh, people are morphologically different and that there's certain people who need a lot of lumbar lordosis and some people who can get by with very little. And we look at certain things, again, during the course of my or Jens's lifetime, things like uh, intraspinous spacers and whatnot. They seem to work great in some people and they seem to work really poorly in others. And I think a lot of it was, again, this failure to appreciate 
how much uh, uh, lordosis people really need to have. So if you're somebody who had a lot of leeway that you could go and you know lose five degrees of lordosis and still be pretty well aligned, something that distracted out a little bit and gave the spinal canal uh, a fair amount of room can, could work pretty well. But we also realize that there's people who are just very uh, you know, precariously teetering on the edge between uh, between uh, between being in a in, in a bad position, and it just takes a little bit, and sometimes the little bit of compensation that you can do by having motion between a segment or two. When you lose that with the fusion, that pushes people over the edge uh, towards not doing well. Now, this slide right here shows the really tight correlation between the lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence in young people, and I think that most everybody here knows that's an important parameter. So again, this is something that we realize. We realize uh, pelvic incidence is important and trying to match that's important. Uh, and we realize that the pelvic tilt's a way that your body uh, goes and compensates as we begin to become out of alignment. And these, these, all these factors, uh, particularly the pelvic tilt change with age, people do get a little bit out of alignment as they age. So what's happening is, is that, is that uh, I remember when this was first presented about 10 years ago, the thoughts of this malalignment. Again, there was an awful lot of skepticism across the, uh, the many, many spine surgeons. And it was thought that, uh, that these were kind of, uh, kind of uh, really uh, unimportant things to recognize. This was something that was really heavily advocated in Europe, particularly in France, and people thought that the, you know that was that, that was crazy. Particularly in the neurosurgery com community, most people said, "Look, at, you know, the reason why people aren't standing up straight is somehow they've got a pinched nerve, and that and that the concept of having to get an X-ray was completely foreign to them." But this is some work from the ISSG that was published in the last two years, and it shows that people who get out of alignment really have a, a tremendous burden uh, on their overall health. And this shows, if you take all adult spinal deformity as a whole, uh, you can see that uh, having, sp uh, having, uh, having spinal deformity is the equivalent of having lung cancer, diabetes, or severe heart disease. And if you look at, and particularly a subset of patients, and these are the people who are really severely sagely malaligned. If you look at, uh, th th this is looking at SF36 um, data, that if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're more than 10 centimeters malaligned, you have a health burden equivalent to having bilateral above knee amputations. I mean, it's a, it's a big, big burden. So that's why when, when we have this thing, the importance of being able to do different type of corrective techniques to put them in a better position is, is really important. So not everybody that walks into the clinic needs some kind of giant operation. And there's a lot of people by doing non-operative care can really make a dramatic improvement. If someone's deconditioned, again, the conditioning is one of these compensatory mechanisms that get people in a better alignment. I don't know if Dave is still in the back of the room, Dave Hanscom, but he, he's a real big believer that certain conditioning programs can make dramatic dif differences. And I, for example, have all my patients go through an aquatics-based physical therapy program before they do. And for some people, it is absolutely life-changing. You know, they do eight weeks of that, and they said, my pain is 80 or 90% better. And you're not doing some giant operation you know you want to make sure that you've that you've done things you know there are a lot of people that you give one or two tramadol a day and they're completely happy and functional and you don't need to do a you know a three hundred thousand dollar operation on them to get them to that same degree so some of the stuff I'm not I'm not saying everybody should rush out and have a big operation and for those of uh, the people who are, who are in the room who have been in my clinics they see that you know oftentimes I've been seeing people for six, eight, ten years sometimes before I finally operate on them. We try all sorts of things. That's an advantage of being in Charlottesville. If I was in New York City, you know, if they if I didn't operate on them, they'd go to the next door down and they'd get a surgery. So uh, so being 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 in the middle of nowhere does help a little bit. You also have to be able to say, hey, look, can I if I am I gonna do I have the capabilities to do a great big operation? You know, you can really hurt people. You can make people worse by doing something that's ill conceived. And even for the people, you know, that 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 uh, you know, w whether it be Jens or or uh, Neil in the back or whoever, you know, the fact is, all of us have somebody, you know, and hopefully it's you know once a year, twice a year, 
only where we do something where we we hurt somebody uh and that's you know it's you know that they've had some massive pulmonary embolism or they have a stroke or they get a bad infection or they develop pjk after pjk but all of us have kind of our horror cases and you really need to keep those in mind when you're recommending surgery for somebody so what's recognized is, is these are kind of in a lot of ways kind of the the current thinking of kind of the holy grail of realignment and what we realize is that we want to achieve our SVA within five centimeters. We want to go and do enough correction that the body doesn't need to actively retroverse their pelvis. And we want to have the lumbar lordosis pretty close to the pelvic incidence. Now, some of this is being revised a little bit depending upon age. Again, looking at things like, uh, like EOS, where we do total body scans, we realize that there may be some parameters better. But right now, this is kind of the thought for the average person about you know, of what kind of goals you want to achieve. And what happens is, if you look at most series, and particularly from series uh, you know, uh, more, than, more than three years ago, that a lot of them showed that the, the goals weren't achieved. That even though you say, okay, I want to do this, um, what we end up successfully doing oftentimes is far less than what we desire to do. Some of that, I think, is preoperative planning. Some of it is compensatory changes your body makes. You may do something really great in the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine changes. But as our understanding becomes better and better, hopefully we'll have less and less bad results. Now, what happens is, is that there are a lot of different ways that we can go and move the spine and correct the spine. And for the people, uh, people who uh, do you know, pediatric surgery, and I do about oh, 15 or 20 percent of my practice as kids, when, the, when someone's young, you, know, you get some 13-year-old with idiopathic scoliosis, the spine just moves. It's easy. The bone is good. And all these things about rod derotation and compression and vertebral uh, you know, segmental translation and rotation are things that are easy to do. Okay. You get some 70-year-old person, their bone and the stiffness of the curves make it that you can't do some of, the, some of these uh, different, uh, different things. But as a general rule, when you distract a, across a segment, you almost always create some form of kyphosis. If you compress across a segment, you cause lordosis. And a lot of times what we do is things like cantilever bending that will put some a rod into the pelvis or in sacral screws and then cantilever the spine to try to improve uh, lumbar lordosis and to, uh, and, to, and to reshape the bottom of the spine. There's all sorts of, uh, if you go to the different companies, different towers and connectors and whatnot to be able to rotate the spine. But the bottom line is if the spine isn't loose enough, all the stuff comes from naught. You end up just plowing your screws or, 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 or pulling them out. So these are basic concepts to understand, but, the, the, but, but in adults in particular, there's, there's a really a very important first step. And this first step is some type of release of the spine to make it mobile. And, uh, and you know, one of, the, one of the most important initial things we do is that we position the patient. And, uh, and one thing that I almost always do in all my patients that I'm going to do a deformity correction is I get an x-ray in addition to them standing up, long cassette x-ray, I get a supine one. And how mobile that is really gives me a very good idea about the potential I have to be able to correct it and how aggressive an operation that I need to get that, to get, to get that done. And so if you look at things, these different releases uh, uh, range uh, for something where we're taking the facet joints off to doing something like uh, Smith-Peterson or Ponte osteotomy where the ligamentum flavum and the facetectomy is done to uh, PSOs and VCRs that we discussed, uh, discussed yesterday. And there's a lot of different factors that, that pick how many and how much we have to do, how big the deformity is, whether it's located, whether it's focal or global, whether it's flexible, rigid, or fused, whether the patient's had previous surgeries and what the pelvic parameters are. And, and as I mentioned to you, I'm a big believer on doing as much you can to make your 
operation is as absolutely precise as it can be because you've planned it out and you've given it enough thought. And things like, for example, this, this person with a post-traumatic kyphosis, this person, if you can see here, is laying over a bolster to see how correctable this is, to say, hey, am I going to need to do something like a PSO or a VCR here, or can I potentially correct it um, just by uh, positioning in, in smaller level osteotomies? And uh, this is a this is a uh, this is a uh, a thing by Larry Lanky, and he he, class, he classifies things into flexible, stiff, which mean they can be actively correctable, and sometimes with minor osteotomies or those people that are uh, fixed, stuck, or fused, which are not uh, are not are not correctable. And this is a case just showing a patient who a lot of people, if you looked at the initial X-ray, said this patient needs a giant PSO. But you can see when the patient's supine, it's somewhat correctable, and after positioning, it's more correctable. And after Smith-Peterson osteotomies, it's totally correctable, and you don't have to do something. Uh, do something. So basically, those people who have long, gradual, uh, more flexible things do better with an SPO. Those people who have a very focal area of, uh, of uh, a fixed kyphosis do better with a PSO or a, or, or a VCR. And again, this is a person that I treated who had multiple different fusion procedures. You can see uh, the, the, the instrumentation disengaged from the from the from the iliac screws and with something like this you just you know you're going to have to do something like a, a PSO in this case an extended PSO in that case. Chris, yeah. Right. Yeah. What's happening is 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 we talked about yesterday um, that increasingly uh, increasingly um, we finding that and you're going to see this at the end of this talk. The, the PSOs in particular have a very high rate of rod fracture. So what you see here is you see uh, two rods, uh, which are the principal rods, then these connectors. And, and in general, what I try to do is, is put the connectors in areas that, for example, are previously fused. So this level right here on the previous, in this previous case, this is solidly fused. So I know that, that, that there's going to be less stresses across that segment. And, uh, and up above here, again, when I looked in there, this seemed to be a solidly fused segment. So what's happening is I'm connecting these two solidly fused segments and reducing the stresses across the primary rods. And as you're going to see in a moment, and I described yesterday, the more you bend the rod, the greater chance that the rod's going to fracture. It really fatigues the rod uh, substantially. Are all four of those rods cobalt-chrome? Yeah, they're all 6-0 cobalt-chrome. Yeah, I mean, this isn't a this is not a perfect correction, but for some reasons why that I that I that I uh, that I kind of limited things a little bit. But you can see here, it's this is uh, two years out. That's nice and solidly fused. Of course, of course. I'm curious about uh, Paul Rader's perspective on this, but what I've started doing recently is actually mixing metals. So I'll I'll, I'll use cobalt chrome and then I'll use titanium as the for the third and fourth rods, thinking that there's a different stress that that you know. They have um, thinking that it would it would reduce the the risk of the construct <coughs> failing, but I, I'm just curious since you've spent a lot of time thinking about those kinds. Of Paul, stuff. well, I think that uh, since rods are in contact, there's no corrosion issues really, um, so that's not a point. Uh, the fatigue light properties are different between cobalt chrome and titanium, as I said. You start bending titanium, you you, the, you do significantly reduce the fatigue life, and that's one of the reasons you're putting that fourth rod in there. But if you can do it non-bent and without a lot of harm to it, I think that's very reasonable kind of construct. What I, what I'm actually doing right now um, is that uh, is that I'm using a, a different connector that has a little bit of uh, variability or play into it so that I can keep that third and fourth rod absolutely straight. And by keeping that straight, I really think that it does reduce the uh, fatigue. Um, uh, as we talked about yesterday, and as you can see at the end of the talk, a lot of people, what they're doing is they're sinking these two screws here deeper and then putting a rod down and then spanning over top of them with a the rod all the way to the top. And that makes both segments of rods straighter. You know, this little one here is a little short straight segment. The one here needs less curvature because it passes over top of them. Uh, and they're 
they're called auxiliary rods. And again, that's something that Manish Gupta and Chris Ames and some others have, uh, have advocated. But, uh, but, but basically, you know, I think there's an increasing belief that in most cases with PSOs and VCRs, you really likely need to have more than just two rods. And, and you'll see some data on that to do it. So basically, when we're talking about the destabilization, you start off, and this is Schwab's classification. One's a partial facetectomy, one's a complete facetectomy, which is a Smith-Peterson or Ponte osteotomy, uh, a, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Let me just put this on silent. There we go. Uh, then removal of the superior end plate in the disc which is an extended pedicle subtraction osteotomy in various degrees of vertebral body resections. So you can see here, this, is, this shows uh, when you have anterior column flexibility. You know, most of the time when, I, when the people who were at my station yesterday, I do partial facetectomies in essentially every level of the deformity correction if I'm not doing something more as much, as much of anything else to get it to be fused. So what happens is you can probably get three or five degrees of correction with this. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is a, uh, a more of a more of a Ponte type uh, correction here that you can get probably between five and ten degrees of correction. What happens is you can see in this patient that I treated a few years ago, you add together you know twenty of these things, and suddenly you know you can see it's partially correctable. And then by doing this, and this is interoperatively at each level that's done, and suddenly you can see that you have a big correction despite only getting a little tiny bit at each, uh, at, e at, e at, e at each level. And you can see the difference in the overall alignment uh, between, the, uh, between the two of them. Here's a, uh, here's a standard pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Here's, again, a standard pedicle subtraction osteotomy case. This is somebody who had, had a fusion, the instrumentation removed, and now I'm redoing it. This is from about eight years ago. And you can see I only have the two, uh, the two rods here. This probably you know, may have gone on to break for all I know. So, so you can take something out asymmetrically and get an asymmetrical correction. Here's uh, removing uh, part of a vertebral body, and again, a case uh, that, 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 that I did at some point uh, showing, showing that. And again, considering I only have two rods, and it's probably from more than five years ago. And then here's a bigger, a bigger uh, type, uh, uh, bigger type uh, 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 VCR uh, procedure here and, and, uh, and here. So basically, this is a uh, this is a, a relatively recent description of when you think about doing SPOs, PSOs, or VCRs. It's Neurosurgery Focus, 2010, and it's a good article to read through as far as the overall thought process. The one thing I have to say is that uh, the PSO is the second fastest growing code uh, um, uh, uh, in, by CMS. Um, it grew 247% between 2008 2011. And the fact is, is that a lot of people who are, quote, getting a PSO probably don't need to have a PSO done. A lot of times it's so, it's so funny how many people are sent to me after a, quote, failed PSO and they still have their pedicle. So <laughs> you sort of wonder what exactly they had done, but they had it coded and it's dictated as a, as, as a, as a PSO. And I think, There's that pedicle. I wonder, boy, they, they must have done something, done something special there. But this is a, <laughs> this is a, this, this is a, this is a, this is this guy, this guy, his, uh, his, uh, this is his his son's a as a orthopedic surgeon in an academic place. He's a he's actually an oral surgeon and came in and just couldn't stand up anymore. We tried all sorts of stuff, and he came to me. I was sent to me for a second or third opinion, and the pre, two previous doctors told him that he needed to have a PSO done, and so uh, so I saw him and got the various evaluation. This is him supine. And this is what I did. Okay, and this operation took uh, took three and a half hours. He lost 600 cc's of blood, and I'll tell you, it's a heck of a lot less morbidity than doing a PSO. And if you look at all the alignment parameters, you can see everything's, everything's pretty good, okay? So not everybody that has some malalignment needs to have a PSO. They're not perfect. This is a case I did years ago where I stupidly did uh, a, a PSO at L2. It's completely non-physiologic. You know, I increasingly move the, the PSOs lower and lower. My most common level now is doing it at L4, sometimes even doing ones at L5 because, again, it, it gives a more physiological restoration. And I think there's other things that are other alternatives besides doing this. And you can see 
that failure that was there was purely due to me overcorrecting in a non-physiological manner and eventually the revision that I had to do. Basically, if we don't get a good result for us because we didn't plan well, we didn't execute well, or there's some type of adjacent segment uh, issue or comp compensatory mechanism that makes it better. Again, you can see, you know, this is me, again, done some years ago, uh, but clearly I did a crappy job on this patient's, uh, patient's uh, revision surgery and was still maligned after I finished it. You know, the planning's important. You know, uh, Steve Andre brought this trigonometric metric formula about it, and there's been a lot of other things that have been described about how to do the uh, do the correction. This is actually this thing right here is the most uh, I think at this point's been shown to be the most accurate way of calculating how to go and get correction. Uh, unless unless several of us are a math major, it's a little bit much. But sometimes with the planning software, or increasingly with planning software, this can be uh, brought into bear so you know exactly what's going to happen and what's going to happen uh, as far as compensatory mechanisms are, 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 are concerned. So basically, these, these are the kind of planning things that we want to do. There's a lot of free planning software that's out available for you to tell you what you need to do to take into consideration what the pelvic tilt is, how sagittally malaligned it is, and what size and location of the corrective osteotomy that we that we want to uh, that we want to uh, want to do. So you can see again how to correct it, and if we do that, the chances of us getting a good alignment are uh, are uh, are much better. Again, just uh, looking at the different types of uh, different types of correction. So. Don't want to go into, into too much. The one thing to realize is that uh, people that have, uh, who have a, a large SVA, that they're very sagely imbalanced, and who have a huge uh, amount of pelvic retroversion have even a greater amount of deformity than, than what oftentimes in the past has been appreciated. And this just shows those people with a large pelvic tilt need a much greater degree of correction. So if someone's got a normal pelvic tilt and you calculate it out, uh, the, the, the average correction is usually around 28 degrees, but those people with a huge pelvic tilt need a much bigger amount of correction to get the, uh, to get the uh, right, uh, right amounts. Again, just showing again some of the different planning. So basically, these big operations have a lot of potential complications. We discussed the inadequate correction, but other things can go, uh, go with it. As we do bigger and bigger cases, the risk of complications uh, become, uh, become, uh, become higher. Um, you know, if you look here, uh, that depending upon the magnitude of the uh, surgery, the co major complication rate was up to uh, 42%, uh, and things like the age of the patient, the, the, the having a bigger number of osteotomies are factors that are associated with having, uh, having more problems. Um, one of the problems with these uh, the correction of the lumbar spine is, uh, is uh, loss of correction in the unfused uh, thoracic area. This is, again, a patient of mine showing that, how initially it looked good and how over time it, uh, we it lost correction. And these are things that we're trying to figure out and to, uh, and to address. PJK, which is the subject for a whole other set of lectures, uh, is really sort of the major bugaboo that most of us who are doing a lot of this are, are, are facing. One of the things which has really radically changed my practice is uh, a much greater amount of thought and uh, action put into place uh, to reduce blood loss. Um, this is uh, this is uh, this is something called a Rotem, and Rotem is a rotational thromboelastometry. Uh, what that is is a mechanism that they can real time know the entire coagulation. Uh, parameters on your patients. For most of your patients, if you go someplace where they do liver transplants or whatnot, they routinely uh, they routinely use Rotem. Our anesthesiologists at UVA have been using Rotem on the on the spine cases and has uh, essentially the combination of more aggressive uses of uh, of antifibrinolytics and the use of Rotem has gone and reduced our blood loss by greater than 50%. Huge savings in costs and huge savings in complications. Um, this is from some of our UVA thing where the average uh, transfusion of, uh, of, of uh, pack red blood cells uh, has, uh, has, has, has been reduced uh, in half, and this just shows some, uh, some, uh, some of these. Um, one of the options I mentioned is not everybody needs a PSO, and by doing SPOs uh, is a way to reduce uh, complications. 
So the last thing is, is that, you know, when you do these big, uh, big cases, rod fractures and non-unions, particularly with PSO cases, is really a, a big, big deal. This is some work from the ISSG and just showed all the different rod fracture levels. And this shows the different type of rods, how frequently occurred, showing the rod diameter. You know, it's cobalt chrome, stainless steel, all the different things and how frequently it occurred. And what we found was in our group that there was an almost 16% rod fracture rate. And if someone had a PSO, most of them occurred with the, within a year. Early failures uh, were most common with the PSO and uh, bigger patients and people had greater correction of their uh, malalignment had, uh, had, had, had that done. This just goes and shows that, uh, that, 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 that the rods break. Uh, there's certain things that you can do to prevent it. This is uh, looking that if you look at uh, 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 com uh, commercially pure titanium, titanium alloy, uh, stainless steel and cobalt chrome. In this particular thing, the cycles of fatigue uh, uh, going on to uh, going on to failure. The bigger the rod you have, the less chance is going to break. But if you have a huge rod, the greater the chance you're going to rip some implants out if you don't go and loosen the uh, the, the, the spine. Notch sensitivity uh, creates a stress riser. This is most uh, accentuated in titanium and titanium alloys. And this just shows uh, where a rod was bent and on biomechanical testing where the, uh, where the fracture uh, in the rod occurred. So you can see the mark here from, uh, from a French rod bender is uh, where, the, where the fracture occurred. Uh, basically, just, just going through this, uh, that it's been shown that the straighter the rod is, the less chance of it's breaking. If the rod's straight, then sometimes uh, you can get a break, uh, get a break uh, from the bending, and sometimes it occurs from where the, uh, where the, uh, where the screw is done. So the, the bottom line for all this is the straighter the rod, the less chance that it has uh, broken. Rods that are pre dosed have less chance of having, having, uh, having a fracture than those ones that, uh, that, uh, that you bend uh, during the course of the, uh, of the surgery. And this just shows some different biomechanical data showing all those different, uh, different things. So basically, just go through there, I just kind of gave you the, 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 su the summary for that. So uh, basically, if you have a rod that's straight or pre dosed, it fractures a lot less. If you have to bend it, you know, if you can limit the bend, that uh, that limits uh, that limits the uh, limits the uh, limits the fracture. And again, there's just uh, some more information uh, discussing that. So uh, so lastly, this is some great work from uh, from from uh, from Chris Ames out of UCSF, and it just showed uh, really very very convincingly that the more you go and you bend a rod the greater the chance that the rod is, is, is going to break. And they found that the difference, as you went from 10 degrees to 30 degrees to 60 degrees of rod bend, the, uh, the, the, the fracture rate, the number of cycles it took to it fractured, just dramatically, uh, dramatically went and dropped off, as you can see here. So that's a 20 degree bend, 40 degree bend, 60 degree bend. And you can see in this thing, that it only took a couple hundred cycles with a really, really bent rod for it, uh, for it, uh, for it to, uh, to 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 break. So basically, anything that you can do. Again, this is one of my patients here from some years ago. To reduce the rod bend uh, really has a uh, has a has a big impact uh, on doing there. So this is the last point that I, I threw these slides in. This is again looking at the ISSG data, looking whether you had two rods whether you had three rods, either being an accessory rod, meaning on top, or a satellite rod out to, the, out, to, out to the side, or four rods, and these just shows examples of it. These are accessory rods where the rod passes over it. Here's a four rod accessory rod. These are the satellite rods, which I more frequently have done. And what you see here is that the, that the as the number of rods goes up, the failure rates go down. And as you use the accessory rods, the ones that lay over the top work a little bit better than the satellite rods uh, for this. So basically, the bottom line is, is, that, uh, is that when we're doing these techniques, and just flip through there, uh, that, you know, that I use large diameter cobalt chrome rods. I always use satellite or accessory rods. I use inner body, uh, inner body implants in areas with the biggest risk uh, uh, of failure. So the bottom line is, is that, is that uh, I wanted to give you uh, a rationale for why 
we do these corrections. I wanted to go and show you that it's important to loosen the spine to do it. Then most importantly, as we're doing these big things, having some consideration about the implants that we're using really helps to reduce the potential complication rates. Okay. Mm -hmm.